So we've already called the meeting to order. We had an executive session. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is the June 20th meeting of the Dell Springs Village Council. Uh, the roll has been called, um, and we're now on to announcements. Brian, I assume you'll have some. Of course. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I did want to um, emphasize that this weekend, uh, and the highlight is uh, June 25th, is going to be the fifth annual Yellow Springs Pride event. Um, I know the parade starts at 5. Folks are gathering here at the John Bryan Community Center at 1 for a variety of celebrating. Uh, there are movies all day at the Little Art Theater celebrating um, uh, LGBT. And um, we also have the Ruby Girls at the Little Art Theater at 6, and then they move to Peaches later that evening. Um, so I encourage people to come out and uh, support YS Pride. Uh, also, um, Patty, should we just move 4th of July up front? So that I know it was in your report, but just what's happening 4th of July? Um, oh, okay, well, uh, I know the uh, lineup for the parade is 2 p.m. Uh, as per usual at Friends Care Center, and the parade will start at 3, and fireworks are at Gone Park at dark. And um, because July 4th is uh, a holiday, our next council meeting will be Tuesday, July 5th. Oh, and, oh no, this is a correspondence, never mind. Okay. Thank you, anyone else? Uh, next, we have on our agenda the consent agenda. We have minutes of June 6th, uh, regular meeting. And, and I do have some corrections that have been um, delineated in the email that was sent by Mr. Clenchitz to Chris Conard. I can go ahead and make those changes after listening to the tape if you want to keep it on the consent agenda. Okay. Um, the minutes of June 8th, 2016 special meeting, the work session regarding municipal firework fiber and the financials for May, which includes the audit report for 2015 for review by council. I get a motion, please. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 A review of the agenda. Um, do we want to add or change uh, or move anything? Um, move the order. Uh, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications? Uh, yes, so uh, we got a very nice uh, thank you note from Holm Inc. Uh, about attending the groundbreaking session for the 21st and 22nd affordable home in Yellow Springs. Judith uh, gave a really nice talk and uh, it was really nice to be there and see some uh, wonderful families uh, that are moving to the, uh, uh, to the community. I think in total the two families had six young children, so that was really exciting. Um, Henry Myers uh, submitted a short letter um, about street fair getting too big, um, and uh, uh, it kind of relates to um, our policy as a village for what we support um, that wise. Uh, Rick Donahue, Donahoe uh, provided a letter related to the Morris Bean proposed uh, extension of sewer, um, suggesting that uh, we should annex and also the need to protect our wellhead. Uh, Laura Curlis also submitted a letter highlighting uh, Ordinance 10-4808, uh, which we'll, uh, I think, talk about later on in the meeting. Um, related to uh, annexation and connections outside the village and suggesting that we needed to uh, adjust that legislation. And then, Karen, do you want to talk about your letter? Um, well, it was written by Patty, so I have nothing to say about it other than to um, ask if council is okay with uh, with me signing it and sending it on. Do you want to it, take it, it, it was, to yeah, it? It was actually written by AMP, um, and we just filled in the blanks. It has to do with the uh, a new committee that's being um, formed to uh, talk about the tax exempt bond issue. Municipal uh, Finance Caucus. Right, the Municipal Finance Caucus to uh, to encourage the legislature to keep these bonds tax exempt. And it's a bipartisan effort. I uh, appreciate it. And I think indicative of the fact that Congress isn't doing much of anything right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so is it okay if I sign that and send it on? Okay. Um, 
Next we have um, legislation. Um, first is second reading of public hearing of ordinance 2016-11. Uh, we can read that by title only, Judy. Yeah, this is repeal of chapter 1266 signs of the codified ordinances of the village of the old town of Ohio and, and enacting new chapter 1266 signs. Thank you. And uh, we have our <coughs> administrator, Jimmy Swinger, here to discuss uh, these changes. Did, did you want to go ahead and get a motion? Oh, I guess I could get a motion. Yes, please. Thank you. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, as I reported at your last meeting, um, the Planning Commission has made a number of changes to the sign ordinance, um, specifically allowing ground signs in the V1 or Central Business District, allowing internally lit signs in Business 2, and in the Business and Industrial Districts, uh, increasing the types of signs from 2 to 3 and the total number from 3 to 4, and in the case of a multi-tenant building where the maximum number of permitted signs has been reached, one additional per tenant shall be allowed. Um, all the other changes were that were made were to further clarify the code and just make it easier to interpret. Um, at the last meeting of council, um, you uh, amended the code to add the word regulations in section 126609, so it reads Green County Building Regulations Official, consistent with other places where this title is defined. Um, under incidental signs, council striked not exceeding a total of two square feet a total of two signs per business, um, and that took care of that one. And then also, um, I followed up with the solicitor regarding uh, the time frame for placing uh, political signs and taking them down, and was told that you know it can be challenged on private property, but that we could still have the time frame included since it is there as a guide. Um, and I also included a, a suggestion if you want to soften the language a bit in, in your back there. Okay. Um, I, I would, maybe we should just strike it completely, ways or we can, or just keep the well, suggested language. The suggested language seems fine to me. The, the request, is, is that the mm -hmm. thing? Yes. <laughs> The village requests signs be placed early, earlier than so it's. I, I think it's thirty days. It does create, days it does create some clutter over time. So, I mean, so this would mean that if somebody you know wanted to have their burning sign up, you know, in between, uh, you know, the um, you know, I guess February or March fifteenth and. Or April fifteenth, I guess it was. They would not be able to do that, right? No, no, it's not what a suggestion. It, it's a suggestion. We have a lot of people that call wanting to know when can we put them up. We're just giving a suggested time frame. Um, if they're putting it in their private property, they can keep it up. I mean, the carry sign was up all through the Bush administration setting term, so <laughs> nobody said I didn't it. My Bernie sign. And so I, I guess. I, and so the goal of this is to eliminate clutter. That's just having yes. I mean, a little bit of visual pollution there. Trying to get people to be responsible as to when to take. Most people will take them down, but you have people not sure when they can be put up. It's just giving them a but, reference. Point. But there isn't. I mean, I'm. I guess I'm almost more bothered by the putting them up thing because if you say 30 days before, but there really isn't a limit. That seems. That seems really, you know, I'm I'm more about you know maybe suggesting that they that they're removed, but um, not so much when they go up. I mean, somebody could put them up whenever. You know, there really isn't. I mean, what we're what we're being told is that there isn't any limitation. They can be kept on, and and, and I would would that include things like no fracking, or, or are we just talking political candidate? Are we talking are we talking levies? Are we talking what kind of political signs are we talking about? Political signs including like ballot issues, yeah. Levies. Would it be issues like no fracking? What? No, I mean, to, I thought the language in it said was specific to election related well, uh, election, signs. Elections correct. and ballots, yeah. Right. right. So a levy yeah. is a I, mean, I like the idea of having a suggested time frame and uh, People don't always abide by it, or might have some reason they want to keep it up longer. But it, it most of the signs will come down and go up now before that, which 30 days is plenty long, I think. 
instead of requests, how about suggests? I don't know. Because request, it's softer. It's, 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 up but it's you, can, you can amend. It still is a little bit, sounds a little bit like we're requiring it. So actually, Chris, maybe can you just speak to, I mean, is, is there any legal implication at all with this kind of language? Because, you know, I, I happened to talk to Fairborn, and they used to have this language, and they removed it because of a case in New Jersey. Well, in the case in New Jersey, I believe, the there were efforts to enforce their ordinance. And so effectively, almost every community, at least in Ohio, has some language like this, but nobody enforces it. Okay. And, and, and what ends up happening, as you know, is when candidates run, they contact their local board of elections. The board of elections says, look at what the, you know, what the, the suggested guidelines are for your community. And so most communities have 30 or 45 days uh, to avoid the clutter of what those signs are. Uh, most candidates are pretty responsible about getting their signs up and down, but not all. Um, but if somebody wants to leave that sign up on their private property, whether it's a candidate sign or for some particular issue that's, uh, that they have a strong belief in, that sign can stay up. Some communities have restrictions that says you can only have one political sign. But again, it's, it's just not forced. I mean, I remember it was presented as a pretty hard and fast rule that you did not put up signs before 30 days. That was what was presented, I think, every time I've run. And that's misinformation. I mean, that's, well, that wasn't, that's in our, that wasn't in our zoning code, so I don't know if that was coming from Board of Elections. Or was, I, that might have been in at one time and maybe taken out then, later. I don't know. But it's not been in our code. Yeah, I, I guess I'd pause because, I mean, I, I just haven't called Fairborn and Beaver Creek. You know, and they do not have any kind of restriction like this. And, and I just wonder. I, I personally don't mind it. I, I just, you know, wonder why we're doing it. If I think it mostly is about the local elections. That's when we get most of the signs. So, and I am comfortable having some kind of language about that. So that people start at one time and get their signs out of there. Just to say that when Denise and I were talking about it, there's a little heavier weight towards having some sort of a, a time frame suggested when I pull the clerks of council. Some have pulled it off entirely because they have been challenged in the way that Chris mentioned. They did try to enforce it. But where it becomes relevant is when a someone who's directing a campaign wants to know, when can I get these out to all the yards that said they would take my signs? And for them, that regulation makes sense. They put them out, they pick them up according to what is suggested. And then if individuals want to leave them up, it's because it's not enforced, it tends to not, it reduces clutter because there are campaigns that put out the signs and take them up again according to what you say. These are the suggested dates, which is the only reason to, to do it. If it were simply individuals, there would be no reason to do it. But I think the issue is more about before, before the election. I mean, you know, why not put them up 30 days before the election? Before 30 days? Yes, before. Or, if, yeah, yeah if, if I may, um, City of Painesville Building Department versus Dworkin and Bernstein, a 2000 Supreme Court of Ohio case specifically found unconstitutional um, time limitations on political signs in pri on private property. So people put sign political signs on private property. You can't put time lim limits on them. You can put limits on things like um, where they go, like are they in the right of way, or are, are they trash now because they're so tattered and they're blown around or some such thing. But um, that's why the cities don't have but, those now in Ohio. But can you suggest? Um, if, if, it's, if it says it's a I'll leave that to your solicitor. I'm just saying there is a Supreme Court case on point. The, the, it, it's, an, it's an enforcement issue. There's still a number of communities that have it on there, and, and we've reviewed the case. And it's, and it's clearly any enforcement effort is not constitutional. It, it, it really is more of a guideline. And what typically happens is the candidates try to respect that, uh, that standard. But if a candidate wants to put their signs up a year in advance of the election, we can't stop it. I think we should know. I think we should strike it. I, I'm more convinced that we should. Can you actually be sued for having language of suggested times? 
<laughs> you know, I, if we don't enforce it. <laughs> I mean, another option might be that just uh, when people call, because it's the local elections, that we say, you know, that this is not enforceable, but the suggestion is that. Well, and that's an interesting idea, because one thing I like that Fairmore does is every person that's on the ballot, they send them a letter and uh, they mention sort of their guidelines and also who to call if your sign got pulled because it was in the right of way. I would like to do something like that regardless of what we decide on this. Yeah, I, so. I, I don't want to put him on the urban staff. I mean, it's, I've been here for 40 some odd years and whenever I ran, I called down and they gave me the suggestion I think, I think in the past, you know, perhaps Green County may have had it. We didn't have it, and every year it, it's a we were it was a question that keeps coming up. And so um, last time Green County didn't have an answer, and so we weren't really sure. I, I would think that if you didn't want to have that language in the codified ordinances, that the village could contact the Board of Elections and give them language that you would want to tell them to candidates and say the village has no codified ordinances with time limits. We'd ask that you consider doing it 30 days before the election. You know? Yeah, Denise, I, do you think that normally people call about that question as opposed to look it up online? Would you agree with that? Yes. So the, the chances are good that we're likely to get more of the calls asking us the question then people are going to find the answer on their own looking it up. So not having it in there may not be as it's much. It's just kind of a guideline just for us as much as that as, yeah. as everybody else. So. so if an employee looks it up, the information is handy and consistent. Okay. Okay. So I would make a motion to remove it. Remove that language on. Uh, Can I get a motion? Somebody? You just made it, Judith. Second. All those, and we can do a voice vote. Can we do a voice vote on that, or do we need to do a roll call? Can you do a voice vote? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying yes. Second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what do we specifically, we are eliminating the language from where? From the code. From the code. From, from the, yes, from the zoning code. On the political side. So on the political side, only. Like that's the only change. Okay. We're removing that language. We're removing the 30 days. Yeah, yeah you're re removing this section here that says political signs, signs dealing with candidates or issues appearing on a ballot in an election sanctioned by the Board of Elections. If, but we are keeping signs shall not be placed in the street right of way. If you're eliminating the section, now what do you think? You have to eliminate the whole thing. Oh, I thought we were just. I, don't, I think we just the specific language. I thought. I, I don't think we have to oh. allow them to be in the right of way. No, no, no you don't. But I so I wasn't that, sure that was what you were making motion. I'm just trying to move it along. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever works. So okay, let's read the language regarding time frames. Okay, and I'll second that motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Anything else um, that we need that you need to point out? Denise, not on that one. Okay. One neon is still allowed, right? Is neon still allowed? Is we just use internally. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Strike neon. This is the second reading, and it is a public hearing. Um, I will open the public hearing uh, for comment or questions from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council table. Any comments, any additional comments or questions from council? Okay, um, Judy? Yes, Hensley. Yes. Sims? Yes. Ouch? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Okay, um, the next one is 2016-12. And this is repealing section 1248, I'm sorry, 1284.08 definitions 
R through S of the codified ordinances of the of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 12B 4.08 definitions R through S. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. And this only has the what is permitted signs in the language uh, in definitions. Um, if it's a, not a permitted sign or if it's a sign that doesn't require a permit, it, that has been um, put within the language that's in uh, the sign ordinance 1266. And it just cleans that up instead of having all those definitions. Okay. Any comments or questions from council? This is the second reading. I will open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing no comment, I'll bring it back to the table. Judy? Sims? Yes. Couch? Yes. Templin? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Winter? Yes. Thank you, Denise. Thanks, Denise. A lot of work. And thanks to Planning Commission Jerry and Judith and all the rest. Please thank them for all that work. Uh, next, we have 2016-13. Um, Judy, let's read this in. All right. In full. Yes. This is approving the amended sanitary sewer connection agreement with Morris Bean and Company and authorizing the village manager to enter into the amended sanitary sewer connection agreement. Whereas beginning in the early 1990s, environmental concerns have been expressed in regard to Morris Bean and Company's NBC package plant because it sits atop the village of Yellow Springs as well field. And whereas historically, previous village councils in the Ohio EPA have supported NBC's desire to connect to the village's sanitary sewer system to protect the well field, and whereas the connection to the village sanitary sewer system is consistent with the current and soon to be amended wellhead protection management plan, and whereas the connection to the village's sanitary sewer by NBC would mitigate a potential hazard to the wellhead, and whereas the village council has determined that it would be in the best interest of the village to allow NBC to connect to the village's sanitary sewer system to alleviate environmental concerns and approves the amended sanitary sewer connection agreement. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1, Council hereby approves the amended sanitary sewer connection agreement with Morris Bean and Company <coughs> in a form substantially similar to the agreement attached here to as Exhibit A. Section 2, Council authorizes the village manager to enter into the amended sanitary sewer connection agreement with Morris Bean and Company in a form substantially similar to the agreement attached here to as Exhibit A. In Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Who is um, Patty? Are you going to speak to this? <coughs> uh, Chris or Steve, I would assume one or the other. Or well, I, go ahead. I think the, the matter now is uh, before council for the first reading uh, to determine. Uh, whether or not uh, it wants to uh, consider approving uh, that single tap in, uh, into uh, the sewer. Um, the, uh, the agreements attached to the legislation, um, representatives of Morris Bean are here, Steve McCready, they're a people council, they're at Klein, Larry, who were here last week. Um, I think that uh, at the last uh, council meeting, there was an extensive history given of, of the relationship between Morris Bean Company and the village, and uh, decades of discussion on the subject. Uh, so other than that, at this point, I really don't have anything more to add. I don't know, Steve, or whether you have anything to add at this point, but they're certainly available for questions. I have a couple questions. We got the agreement. Chris? Chris. Yes, I'm sorry. So under terms of agreement six, number C, um, uh, the first sentence, uh, can, you, can you explain, it says, uh, prop, in the event NBC or any future, potential future owner of property desires to convert the property or any portion thereof to residential use or any development other than any use listed in section A1 of the agreement, uh, and then it talks about annexation, but I don't understand what's the use listed in section A or 1A. Well, back the intention of the agreement is in section 1A. Pull it up here. That if the property were to continue, if uh, the company were to continue in its current form uh, or to engage in uh, commercial agriculture or other industrial purposes so um, essentially it, it would be uh, 
there would be a residential development is what would trigger the right of annexation. So any commercial or business development would not trigger the annexation? Would not. But it would also would not include the right to any additional tap-ins to the village sewer. So there's only going to be one tap in. And that's that's clarified in this particular. Where is that? It's in the whereas provision in, in definitional sections. Um, in B through one sewer tap in connection okay. and the facilities defined. And so does it matter in 1A that it says MBC's use of the property for those? Is that qualification or more? Uh, that, that's language that we wanted uh, to remain in there. And, uh, having I discussed that, and uh, uh, the, I think the intention is that if there were a successor entity, um, that that would trigger a right, potential right of annexation. Uh, even a successor, um, business or industrial prop, uh, buyer or just residential buyer? The, if it were a successor entity and they simply bought the more speed property and ran the business as it currently exists, the intention is that that would not trigger the right, hand, right of annexation. But if there were expanded use or changed use, that could. Okay. And that's what I understood too. And I, but I don't, I don't, where is that delineated for additional commercial or industrial use? Because I know it's, we, we let, because by leaving in the language NBC's use. Okay, okay. So that is the that's, qualified use. That's, makes me feel better. Okay. Okay. So just so I'm clear, so Morris Bean gets bought out by a bigger company, but continues doing the same thing, that would not trigger annexation. Correct? That's correct. That's correct. I mean, I, I think he should be giving you advice, but that's my yeah. understanding. <laughs> that's, that's my understanding as well. <laughs> Other scenario, Morris Bean gets bought out by someone who maybe does some of the same things, but adds on and, and really changes the changes that would occur. It could. I mean, the, the couple things there. One is we specifically limited to one tap, and that there's limitations to how that tap can be used. For example, a stormwater runoff can't go into it. Yes. Um, it essentially has to be water that have meets with an EPA criteria. Um, and in terms of um, what the company did that came in as a successor entity. And uh, if they completely change the use, yeah, I think my, my position would be that it triggers the right of annexation. But you know, it doesn't sound, it sounds to me like if it's no longer worth being uh, in company from the property generated from, it says uh, it will, it sounds to me like if it's a, a successor company that it does not, uh, that it would trigger annexation. It sounds to me like. Would or wouldn't? It would. Right, yeah, because if you go back, then if you go back to 6C or any development other than use listed in Section 1A, which is specifically it's the worst thing. Yeah. Although it may, is that right? We restate what you just said. Okay. It says, we'll accept the sanitary wastewater, including, excluding stormwater, etc from the property generated from Morris Bean and Company's use in the property for commercial, agricultural, or other industrial purposes. Her, her point, her question is, if, if Morris Bean and Company longer, sells out yeah, and becomes an a a a ABC company, but they're doing the same thing as Morris Bean, yeah, exactly. because this specifically says Morris Bean is ABC, then we, are they required to annex? That is her question. Yeah, and the intention that we had it was no, unless there was some expanded or changed use that, and Patty, you, you wanted the language on NBC left back, NBC left in. 
I did yeah. because I knew this question would come up about if they sold. Um, but um, I believe Steve said we need to tie it back to the current the current use and to the uses listed in, and we were trying to make it consistent. Yeah, I think Chris has explained it. If there's a successor, and there's actually language, it's an 8C, and they're doing what exactly. Morris Bean is doing, you, Morris Bean only using the one tab, then there would not be a requirement for annexation. If there's residential use, there clearly would be um, annexation. And then what Chris is speaking, I think, saying, and Chris, tell me whether I understand you or not. If there is expanded use, a need for additional tap ends, something changes significantly That's in true. terms of the use, then at that point, the new owner would have to come that, to the city and talk to you. That triggers the requirement. That's my understanding, Chris. Is that your understanding as well? That, that's what we talked about. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I have another question. Um, under default 7C, specific performance, it says parties recognize that the village's obligation under this agreement are unique. What is that? I mean, why is that in there? What's the intention of that? Well, the, the intention is on the specific performance is that because uh, that we would have we would continue to perform by allowing the sewer the tap into the sewer and if we decline to do that the remedy would be specific performance meaning they continue to tap in other words we can't just say you no longer have access to the sewer tap Marianne there's a Supreme Court case that says that even if you allow someone to tap outside um, the, the municipal limits that at some point in the future should the village decide to sever that service and require annexation there's a Supreme Court case that says you can do that I think that this particular section may be a way to say that that won't happen once we allow this anything else comments or questions from citizens Our Curlis Village of the Old Springs, I was the manager when Morris Bean came uh, one at a time for this. And at that time, um, council agreed that it would be unwise to um, allow them to have sewer without annexation. This is very rare. Cities and villages generally do not give away their sewer without annexation. And they do it for tax fairness reasons, for sustainability reasons, for the whole village and all the services. We spend a lot of time, the chamber does, trying to bring businesses here into the village so that part of the reason is we have the income tax to sustain all services. And here you have the opportunity to do that. I would require annexation. In lieu of that, this is a very extremely friendly agreement to Morris Bean. This could be a lot tighter and a lot more protective of the village's rights. Um, limit, the, limit the years, it's a 99 year with 99 year automatic renewables. I think the use definition is way too broad. It's and and the parcel you're allowing an ag parcel in here. There shouldn't be three three parcels. There should be two. The commercial use, the ag use, the industrial use. If you read the the township zoning code, those are extremely broad. If you if I th I they're trying to say it's narrow, but I think it's very broad. So that things like a bleaching plant could come in, uh, salvage yard, all kinds of manufacturing. And I don't think that would violate the agreement. This, this, is, this is prime for litigation, and the village is going to be paying the prevailing party's um, attorney's fees. There's so many very um, provisions in here that should not be in here if the village decides to move forward at all. I really think you should have a second opinion. I think you should have this looked at very closely before you enter into it. And I certainly am in favor of, if we want to bring in a, a property, they should be required to annex. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Chris Zerbuchen from the Village Yellow Springs, and I agree that if we want to extend our services, that we ask the company to be annexed to our village. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you 
Kenneth and I were around when this when this first came up, and we were part of the of the initial and Jerry, agreement. And Jerry, and, and Jerry um, well, I think it was actually even predated Jerry initially. Um, and I think that um, I don't, I won't speak for Judith, but for myself, I I agree. But I do think that that there are there can be mitigating circumstances. I think in this situation, the potential environmental damage. Um, that could that we are potentially preventing by having them on our sewer system rather than a, um, a package plant is a benefit to the village and to a broader, especially protecting our wellhead um, and part of our wellhead protection plan. So I think that um, it's I think that there are there there can be circumstances that do um, rise above um, the. The practice, the policy that we would like to um, that we would like to follow, which is annexation for services. Uh, what I don't like is just the uh, what I don't like is that it sort of comes before us with a lot of time pressure. Mm -hmm. So there's no time to really uh, explore a little more thoroughly the sorts of concerns that citizens are bringing up. You know, we heard about it last meeting, and it's like we have to do it immediately. I don't like that. Uh, so I feel like, you know, there's not enough time to kind of thoroughly look at these concerns. Well, we, we don't be, you know. Because I'm understanding that, that Morris Bean is under some kind of a time pressure, and then we're being told, I always hate that. I don't, I don't feel like it's fair to the political process if you, if you have these kind of important decisions, that there be enough time to really do a thorough uh, assessment of what our options are and so on. It seems really important. So, so I mean, we do, we don't have to take a vote tonight. If we don't, we could, you know, have the reading, I mean, which we've done. If we don't have to take a vote, we can take a vote. It's not the final vote. We'll have a second reading. Um, what I think maybe we need to think about is what do we want to know? What do we feel like we're missing? I mean, to just to just not take a vote and not ask staff and legal counsel to come back with more information, I mean, I feel like we're, we're spinning our wheels. So we need to be more explicit about what information we want to know and we want to come back at the next meeting. Well, I have a couple of questions. One, I, one the reason I assume for that Morris Bean does not want to be annexed is because you don't want to pay the taxes. Is, that, is there any other reasons? I think it's best that we defer that question to the next meeting. Bill Negro cannot be here. He's taking his grandson to China for a high school graduation of the trip where he would be here. Bill Negro has been dealing with this for 40 years. Bill Negro, you know, runs at least part of the business. And I hate to speak on behalf of the company about issues like annexation. So I would just encourage you to add, and I think Larry handles the more technical side of things and can answer anything technically you want. But Bill will be here at the next meeting and I encourage you to ask him those questions. So the other question is, what is the time, could, could you all explain what time pressure you're under and just sort of elaborate on that? Because you have the option of either getting our sewer or creating your own septic, redesigning your septic system. Correct, and it's actually been in the process of redesigning. You have to remember, I absolutely understand what you say about time constraints, but this has been going on since 92 and then 205 and there was agreement signed and then it got re derailed and then it's back on. And at this point, we were working through the time frame, and we're just, we have to go one direction or another. And I want Larry to correct me if I'm wrong. We have to get, if we're going with the mount system, this only works if both parties want it. And we ultimately were ready to move forward with the mount system and have started down that path. That was in the spring. And, and there was a conversation, I think, with village officials. And then, then Larry, Bill, and I said, do we want to make one more pass? at connecting to the city and the answer was an affirmative yes so our concern is that if this doesn't go forward we can't lose another season construction season 
in terms of building the, the panel system. So we think, you know, we set this up to give the company time to get the new mount system in place and not lose another winter. And that's why we're dealing with these time constraints. Do you have any materials from EPA that, that where EPA gives their, um, and it gives any input on either either solution, either choice, um, what which they would prefer or? Um, well, I think originally the EPA would have preferred connection as opposed to any type of on-site system, whether it be our company or any other company, I always prefer to see connection to uh, public treatment works. Uh, as far as the mound system itself, we that has been submitted to the Ohio EPA, and we do have a permit to build and install the mound system. All of that was in process after the prior difficulties we had reaching the agreement. That is in place, and we could bid construction now and start construction if we needed to. But the preference would be to connect if we can continue with this agreement. So, so I guess a question coming out of that would be uh, whatever information we could find out about what the environmental threats are or potentially could be from the mound system and it not function correctly. Well, I mean, the, it would be the same essentially as the lagoon system. If any time there's an on-site system, you have the, the potential for contamination of, um, you know, a raw sewage spill of some kind or a, a leak from your mound system, which is what was essentially noted as a, a potential hazard in the wellhead protection plan. Um, the connection to the village sewer would not completely eliminate that. It would probably lessen it. Was there anything in, is there anything in the wellhead protection uh, plan that addresses this? You know, I'm, I'm reading the, the, the ordinance here and we say, whereas historically, village councils and the Ohio EPA support Moore's Beans Company's desire to connect to our sanitary system, number one. Number two, a connection to the village sanitary sewer system is consistent with the current and soon to be amended well at protection plan and a connection to the village sewer by uh, MBC would mitigate a potential hazard to the wellhead. So Patty and whoever prepared this did the research and said these are three good reasons whereas we should do it. So you know, I don't know what else we could have Patty do, and EPA has strongly suggested it, and previous councils have done it. So, I mean, we, we, we just keep pushing this thing. Yes, you know, it's, it's ideal that you annex, okay? But to me, these reasons uh, override anything about canonization and I feel that as a citizen I'm protected in the future because if the business changes in just about any way we have the option of annexing the town. So you know we have that option. You know they can come before us with a huge residential and we can say no or they can come through with the companies we say yes, but I, I think to continue to, to delay this, it's going to do everybody more harm than good. And, and, and I feel that, you know, both parties, we work in good faith to come up with an agreement where some may not say perfect, but we finally had an agreement. I think that both parties can sign. And, and I've been working back and forth with this and and and, 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 and you know I, 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 I think not, not you uh, oh Mr. Mr. Bill Hager yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. yeah he's pissed a lot and we've been a lot but 
think we come to uh, uh, somewhat level of understanding of the issue, and, and I just think that we, we need to move forward. And I'm really here to answer questions. I don't. Right. Not explaining no, that Mr. Right. Mr. Simpson yeah. uh, said because I was thinking about what I would say, and I read whereas and I thought the whereas is probably say it as well as yeah, anything. It's good. It's good. Um, and and I think Larry Larry did say accurately, and it's reflected in the whereas is Ohio's EPA has generally supported a connection. And, and a discussion that Larry and I had just before we came in um, is that that just because a connection is good doesn't mean the mound system is bad. <coughs> in order to put in the mound system, we have to work very closely with the IOP EPA. We have to get permits. I think there's testing involved. So all that's going to happen. And if this doesn't work, we'll go in that direction. But you still have an on-site system that, as I understand it, is over the well area. And that's why if you had to choose between one and the other, we think it's best for everybody, including the citizens, to connect. And we're just here to ask you to consider that. Thank you. Brian, any comments? <coughs> um, no, I guess I, I just think since it was brought up and um, understanding the intent of Morris Bean, um, I would just want to maybe lock down that language about what triggers annexation. If, if, if there is any doubt at all, um, so that that you know goodwill is is clearly there. So are you suggesting an are you suggesting an amendment to what we have here to the to the agreement? Um, possibly just clarifying you know what that that change in use specifically means for triggering annexation and. I mean, I, I think it is implied, but I, I guess that is the one thing that I thought there was a good argument that it could be interpreted differently. So you're suggesting it, uh, that uh, Chris take it back and come back with some, I mean, that's going to have to go back to the negotiations with them, so it's not going to be that easy. I mean, it would, because there, that would be substantively changing the agreement, I would think. I don't think it would be substantively because okay. uh, because you, you've heard from Morris Bean what their interpretation is, so I think it would simply be clarification, not substantive. Okay, well, if you could, then if you could come up with that language that would be a little bit clearer, that would be good. Um, but otherwise, I, I do think an overriding principle here is the wellhead protection. And, you know, I, I think that is, is something we got to, you know, really think carefully about in making this decision. So let's go ahead and take a vote to get to kind of just get the get this initial thing on the record so that, that everybody knows where where this stands. Um, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, the Queen. Um, and we're, we're voting on ordinance uh, 2016-17. Yes. Correct. Yes. 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 Okay. Sims. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Winter. Yes. Thank you all. Um, now we've got 2016-14, uh, and again, let's read this in full. This is repealing Section 1048.08 of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and enacting new Section 1048.08. Whereas the codified ordinances Section 1048.08 of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, regulates sewer connections outside village limits, and whereas Village Council has determined that it would be in the best interest of the village to adopt a new Section 1048.08 entitled No Connections Outside Village Limits of the Codified Ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, to provide that sewer connections can be made outside the village limits, but with the approval of Village Council. Now, therefore, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that Section 1, Section 1048.08, entitled No Connections Outside Village Limits of the Codified Ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be repealed. Section 2, that a new Section 1048.08, entitled No Connections Outside Village Limits of the Codified Ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as follows with new language in bold. 1048.08, No Connections Outside Village Limits. No sewer connection shall be made to properties outside the village corporation limits without the approval of council. Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Chris, this is 
um, yes. basically modifying a current ordinance, replacing a current ordinance that would ostensibly make what we just did illegal. So we're making it legal. Back in 2012, just a little bit of history, the previous legislation you discussed was to amend the sanitary sewer agreement that was approved in 2010. Uh, in 2012, this ordinance, what the words before us now, was amended to say that no extraterritorial services could be extended. So the answer is yes. In order to move forward on the uh, proposed amended sanitary sewer agreement, we would need to amend this codified ordinance, which also makes it consistent with the charter. Yeah, and can you just elaborate on the charter? Yes. The Article 6, Section 55 of the Charter says that public services owned or operated by the village may be extended beyond the corporate limits of the village as determined by council. The rates and charges shall be such, or for such shall be determined by council. We discussed this at the Charter Review, and um, the subject of the 2012 codified ordinance amendment came up, and uh, the, uh, the in that discussion was determined not to, to propose a charter amendment on that subject um, because it gave council the discretion to say yes or no. So reverting the this ordinance, the 2016 uh, proposed change, would make it consistent with the charter and empower council to do what it determines to be best. Um, I want to say, you know, this we passed, uh, Karen and I and Jerry, I think, in 2012, uh, the original ordinance, which said no connections outside village limits, um, with the notion that annexation, whenever we extend utilities, should be required uh, in the best interest of everybody. Um, and I. Uh, when we discussed at the last council meeting the Morris Dean situation, which I think there are extraneous circumstances, our wellhead, the protection of our wellhead, which is very important, kind of trumps all else, perhaps. Um, it can't, you know, we can't force them to annex, so we, we have to look out for the our well our wellhead. Um, but I'm not comfortable with this language. You know, it's not something we discussed. Um, I think if we're going to, we already know the charter says in the end, council can decide. On the other hand, the ordinance, this ordinance, the original, the ordinance about no connections is kind of also drawing a line in the sand of the importance of not. And this doesn't, it just says you can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't underline to any extent, you know, the importance of that principle of not extending uh, services without annexation. So I personally am going to vote against this. It's not something that you know we had discussed ahead of time. Um, if, we're, if we're gonna find some way to change the language, saying under extreme circumstances, we might do this. Um, you know, I would, I would consider that, but I, I don't feel it's necessary um, to pass this in order to, uh, you know, vote for, for the uh, connection for more things. Is that something you can do, Chris? I mean, is maybe well, Patty can rewrite this ordinance? I, I think that we could put in some, what I, I guess I would say, policy considerations or some criteria, something that, that would give some guidance rather than, a, you know, what some type of standard would be. Well, you could do <coughs> something, uh, to do with protecting the health and safety of the safety, health and welfare of the village residents. Yeah, I'm also concerned that we just leave it open ended. I just I fear that there might be circumstances where we could be our hand could be forced for not very good reasons uh, to extend services, and so that's uh, to protect us that you know we can't be forced you know because we made an exception here we made an exception there why are you making an exception? so can we do some research maybe do some research find if there's strong i mean i would i would honestly prefer something even stronger than health yeah. 
safety. wellness and safety. I mean, I, I think it needs to be stronger than that. I think it needs to be more explicit than that. Um, one, one thing I thought of might be that it needs a super majority vote or even a unanimous vote. I don't know if ordinances do that, but that's another way of, of, of doing it so that it's clear that you know this is not just a three to two. So why don't would we consider, should we consider just tabling this? Because it sounds like I mean I I don't disagree. I mean I think that the, I think that you all are making some good points. I think that Chris could go back and either pass it pass it as an emergency. I don't think it's a big deal if we don't pass it. We could do two readings and do it as, as an emergency and still make it in the time frame, the 30 day time frame. So I don't know that we're under absolute well, pressure to get this one passed. Before this, we had the charter saying one thing, and this one is saying the other thing. So I don't, I don't see any. Along without any problem. Yeah. So, so I think uh, taking a little more time is not going to. What do you think? Brian? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm also curious, uh, and you know, I wonder if going back to you know, kind of the, the minutes or whatever, because at the same time that 08 was passed, 07 was passed, which is the surcharge for um, users outside the village. And uh, Patty raised this point uh, before the meeting. It, we not, had people already outside. Right. But this, so. but it, it goes on to say, it, it makes a distinction between pre-existing contractual arrangements. So I, I guess I just wonder, you know, if, if there was something else that was thought about in that discussion, I don't want I don't remember, but I do know there's been that there were times when the village there were again environmental reasons to protect people's water. I think uh, where we ended up extending water uh, because of you know circumstances that okay. were in um, <laughs> But I agree. I mean, I think the uh, the charter clearly allows us to take action on the you know the current agreement. Um, but I think we should also eventually resolve the two, and more time would be good. Right. So, table it or just let's table it. So or we'll make a motion to table. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. I don't need to read from the codified ordinances. Um, okay. Resolution 2016-30. Uh, sure, yeah. This is authorizing the village manager to enter into a letter of intent with AEP on site partners, a subsidiary of American Electric Power Company Incorporated, to negotiate an agreement for a solar array on the glass farm and to purchase the power therefrom. Uh, can I have a motion, please? Second. Uh, Patty? Okay, the first thing that I would like to note is that um, there is a slight amendment to section one um, where it says attached in parentheses. Um, I would like to add the word substantially similar to the attached um, because there are just a couple of very minor points with this um, that were raised late this afternoon. Um, but the, the nexus of the agreement is what is in this. Um, so I would like to amend the resolution to, to read uh, section one, the village manager is hereby directed to execute a letter of intent substantially similar to the attached with AEP on-site partners to build said solar array on the village and property known as the glass farm. Um, this is the letter of intent that um, we've been working on for I think about three weeks now. Um, to begin the negotiations with AEP to build the one megawatt solar array on the western portion of the last farm. Um, it's in exactly the same place that we were negotiating with Atlas on. Uh, it's the same size. AEP is a uh, self-financing entity, so there won't be any problem with the financing. Um, a couple of differences between this and the, um, the Atlas proposal was that um, AEP normally has a clause that um, limits us from negotiating with anyone else for a period of three years if our negotiations with them fall through. I told them that that was unacceptable. So we reached the agreement that if um, the village pays up front for the, uh, the uh, soil borings and the feasibility study, 
once we sign an actual power purchase agreement with AEP, we will be reimbursed those costs. Um, but the intellectual property that is generated from that will remain the property of the village. And the non-negotiation period, should it fall through, um, is limited to 180 days, which will not um, really affect us because if our negotiations with them falter, we won't be able to do anything until next year anyway. So, are there any other questions? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, so does that, is that what is different when you say substantially, um, is there something else? The, we actually retained a, a specialty attorney, Greg Ottinger from the Canal, and was recommended by Chris and John Courtney to review this. He has one section, and I think it's six, I'm trying to remember the number, um, that he has a little bit of concern um, with the, Four six, section four six. He has a slight problem with the wording that he's working out with their attorney. Okay. But other than that, John Courtney is fine with this. Um, John uh, Johnny Burns is fine, and Greg Ottinger is fine. And it was also reviewed by Steve McHugh at Coolidge Hall, so I think we've covered pretty much all four bases. And will we see this again, or is this a you, this this is a resolution? So you will only see it one time. And but this will we're basically giving you so so whatever those final changes are, final clarifications in the contract will just be between you, and we won't yeah. see those again. I can put the final document into the next council packet for your review if you'd like. But I think that would probably be good. I mean, I I, I think it would prob probably be good for us to see the final. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it still needs to be, it'll probably be signed already if that's it once we pass this resolution, but I can show you the final document. Well, I used to say the Energy Board had recommended uh, this organization as the secondary mm -hmm. uh, company to focus on the way. Any other questions, Council? And just to clarify, um, there will be an escalating cost yeah, yes. that wasn't in there will be, um, but I'm hoping to negotiate a slightly better rate than they offered in their initial package, um, and therefore the escalator won't be quite as uh, cumbersome. Okay. Any comments or questions from citizens? Chris Zerbuka, Village in Yellow Springs. I recognize I'm coming late to the discussion, but I have a couple comments to make about development on the glass farm. It seems that we're taking this bolt of silk fabric that we have at last farm and cutting a jacket out of it. And, but we might want to make a kimono and it'll be too late. We're cutting into this property without planning how we're going to be using it in the future. The second point is <laughs> the, um, we have a little finger of property from Fairfield Pike that goes to the west side of the glass farm. And that would probably be used in the future to have a road going into that area because we'll need that for public safety. So we've not taken into consideration as to how that roadway is going to go into that property. Right now it looks like go into the property, turn left at the solar array, and then you get to the rest of the property. Is that a good plan? We don't know because we don't know what we're going to be doing with that property in the future. One of the things that is enjoyable about being out in that area is that we are almost in the country and we can enjoy a beautiful night sky and stars. And so it would be nice to have some of that night sky still stay. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes. I just, I just wanted to say that the um, energy board weighed in very heavily on where the solar array would sit as well. I know staff took a lot of time with the idea that we know, you know, uh, of, we assume the village is interested in other things happening on the glass farm and wanting this to have a kind of minimal impact sort of uh, in terms of placement. And so I think that's, uh, I think there was a lot of consideration to the placement. Um, has, has there been any discussion of, you know, let's say that, that um, 
there is a plan that you know maybe a few panels would need to be moved or removed or something. I mean, is that a possibility? As <coughs> not once you install them because yeah. it's all going to be fenced in anyway. Um, okay. But they, we specifically made the the site area um, back far enough to to put a two lane access road coming in off of. Uh, Fairfield uh, Yellow Springs and then bringing it across. In fact, we were going to build the road to make access to the solar site and just leave it in place, but um, it was substantially more than we thought it was going to be because of the drainage back there and where we would need to put the uh, culvert and bring the road in on the edge of the property. Um, we had my clients behind the engineering look at that and, and give us an estimate on that. So that was the first consideration to begin with. Um, but we did deliberately cite, as Judith noted, the, the solar array so that it leaves room to bring that in there. And one of the things that we intend to do with the PPA is to make sure that not only is it fenced, but it's screened in some way to make it a little bit more appealing um, when the development gets going, perhaps not only with some kind of a uh, a leave to make it a privacy, but also with some maybe vegetation screening. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Um, all the, are, are we ready to take a vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Um, and next is resolution 2016-32. I think we can do this by title only. All right, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract with tech advisors for information technology services. Okay. <coughs> uh, can I get a motion, please? So Second. Patty? Okay, well, I'm going to start out by introducing Bartley Davis, who is here from Tech Advisors. Um, Bartley is in the back of the room waiting patiently. Mm -hmm. um, he is actually going to be the person who is on site most of the time for our IT needs. Um, Bartley, is a, you, you live in Yellow Springs School District, right? Yes. Uh, over by you, can you uh, come John up Park. to that microphone, please? So I live over by John Park in State Park. And so um, Bartley is going to be dedicated to um, any of our needs here. He may not always 100 percent of the time the person responding but if he is available and we have a problem he will be the person responding um, as council knows we we put out a, an rfp for it services we did get five responses um, melissa and i along with uh four sage from Rebecca and uh, ken metz from our police department who handles a lot of their it needs and our connections with our um, police software to xenia we evaluated the five proposals and we recommend to council that we sign a, uh, an agreement with tech advisors as the lowest and best bidder. Um, while their base price was slightly higher than the lowest bidder, when you started adding in all of the um, additional costs for, um, for on-site services as opposed to remote travel time, Tech Advisors was the only proposal that included all on-site visits with the exception of special projects, um, such as running a wire or uh, setting up network stations or servers. Um, and the rate that they proposed that at was a reduced rate compared to some of the other providers. So at the end of the day, when you add all that together, their proposal was the lowest and best. Um, Melissa, do you want to add anything? No, I think that um, just the response time um, with this company as well was uh, far far better than any of the others, so that's important too. So. Okay. Um, and the fact that the Berkeley is going to be very close means that if the PD has a crash or some type in the middle of the night, you know, they can wake him up and he'll come in bright eyed and bushy tail uh, and fix that for him at two in the morning. So, um, Bartley, do you have anything that you'd like to say to council? Or? I just wanted to say that we're very excited about working with you and look forward to uh, starting very soon. Thank you. Well, thank you. So I have a quick question. So I saw that the uh, equipment in our uh, you know, public access station is listed. So this is equipment that you guys have worked with before? The public access is actually a separate um, proposal. And we, we have uh, people on our staff that are perfectly willing and capable of, of working with that. But I think that's a separate proposal. So that would be considered 
extra part of these extra project services? Um, it was listed in what Randall sent us. So it's under yeah. scope. Yeah. It was listed in what um, Randall sent us under the scope part. So um, my assumption is that that would be included then under his scope. But if that's not the case, then we would probably need to, to talk because he did put that in. But if that's the case, then it's probably uh, okay. covered. So, yeah, uh, it, it is listed under the scope. Okay. So. Any other comments or questions, Council? Okay. Any comments or questions from citizens? Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. And so, Patty, when does this start? Um, officially July 1st. Okay. Okay, now we've got um, a last resolution, uh, something that I became aware of last week and I thought it was something that we would want to add um, for, for Village Council uh, to recognize. Um, Judy, would you please read, read this in full? Yeah, this is recognizing Omar Park Estates Day in the Village of Yellow Springs. Whereas in 1955, Omar Robinson developed the community known as Omar Park Estates for all people, but especially for African Americans to have the opportunity to purchase property without prejudice, to build homes and raise their families. And whereas Omar Park Estates represents a significant impact upon the village and the larger community in terms of economy, talent, service, and social contributions, the community is comprised of 58 homes currently valued at over $11 million. And in its zenith, over 90 children lived, played, and grew up in Omar Park Estates. And whereas professionals raised in the community or who later joined the community, Included such professionals as doctors, nurses, attorneys, PhDs, <coughs> veterans from wars from World War II to the Iraq War, including three Tuskegee Airmen, a Buffalo soldier, and officers of many ranks, teachers, professors, musicians, engineers, and countless other professions in which individuals contributed to both the community and society as a whole. And whereas for over 60 years, people from across the United States have at some point called Omar Park Estates their home. And whereas Omar Robinson understood that home ownership is an integral part of the American dream, enhancing the well-being, pride, and prosperity of families, and thereby strengthening communities economically and culturally. And whereas Omar Robinson's dream for his community is a dream fulfilled. Now therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs hereby resolves that. Section 1, July 3, 2016, has been proclaimed by the Mayor as Omar Park Estates Day, and is hereby acknowledged as such by Council. Can we have a motion, please? Second. Um, so, as I said, I became aware of this, and I just think, I mean, we all acknowledge and, and understand what an important neighborhood um, Omar Park is and um, what it did to enhance uh, and bring African American citizens to Yellow Springs. So, um, and I think that there are still a lot of kids in there. I don't know if there are quite 90, but I think that there are a lot, so that's good. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, citizens' concerns. Now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come to the um, podium and keep your remarks to three minutes. Seeing and hearing that, we'll move on to, there's no special reports, we'll move on to old business, which is the follow-up regarding uh, municipal fiber. And um, Patty um, did some research for us. There were, there were a lot of things in our packet um, on this. Um, part of it was, were some um, things from the presentation um, at our June, June 8th meeting, the, uh, um, and then some follow-up papers and some reports by Patty on some research she did. So I guess I'll turn it over to Patty um, to give some input. As you can see, um, I made, I sent out quite a number of emails, I think there were 19 in all that I sent out to the, the various um, cities and towns that are listed there. I, I did not get a lot of immediate response, and, and so what I did on Thursday was I actually sat down and I called all of those who had not responded. Most of them I ended up leaving a, a message for. I did get two email responses and one phone call back um, over the weekend. Um, actually, the one gentleman called on Friday, but I was not um, in my office. So I have yet to call him back or to respond on the other emails um, or to make further follow-ups. Um, my research, um, 
the cities that I chose were either from the list in the um, SpringsNet presentation or from the webinar that the Department of Development had put on. And um, the responses, as you can see, are, are a little bit, I mean, they're a little bit different. Um, the one, Cashmere, Washington, is a, a municipal network. It's a, a county-wide network um, run by the County Public Works, so I tried to get a hold of them, couldn't do it. Um, the Utopia network that um, is in Utah um, is actually a group of, uh, I believe it's 11, yes, 11 cities um, that all join together, and they, they actually have nine separate private providers, and there's some information on that in your packet not only from myself, but from Mr. Kerrigan as well. He sent me some information um, today that Judy put at your tables um, on the Utopia Fiber Network. He also sent a uh, white paper from Princeton, which um, I just got today and I read, and there's some things I want to follow up on in there. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's very varied. Um, one of the things that council wanted to know was what were the next steps? What, what did they do, which was primarily what I was asking them. And from what I can see from the responses, most of them did a feasibility study next. The um, cost of that feasibility, feasibility study varied greatly based on not only the, the geographic area and the population, but on exactly what you want to find out, because obviously, you know, you, you want to do a detailed survey, but do you want them to include a business plan, um, you know, all that kind of thing. A um, couple of things that I found interesting that I don't think any of us had actually thought about was um, why some of the, for instance, the, the one, and I can't remember which one it was right now, um, said that their initial, their initial take rate was lower than what their feasibility study had projected. But they thought that that was because of existing contracts with, with providers that had to run their course before they could sign up and that their take rate came and picked up um, a little bit after that. Um, but I think what I would like to do if council is agreeable, I, I need to do more follow-up with these folks because I don't think that we have enough answers. I mean, I still believe that we need to do a feasibility study next if that's if council wants to move forward with this. Um, and that it probably needs to include not only a, a take rate survey, but also uh, uh, some type of a business plan, you know, because that varied greatly from town to town, but how they did that. But most of them said that that was important to have in place. Um, so what I would like to do is, is to can continue to follow up on these things and um, hopefully have a little bit more detail for council at the next meeting. Could you also come back with information related to um, a process for doing feasibility? You know, who would do it? Um, consultant, you know, so we're, so we're a step ahead, so we're yeah, a little they, bit more prepared. They all they all did consultants, that right? But but so so who? I mean, so you want you would have to put out an RFP. So maybe we write the RFP. I mean, maybe we come with the RFP. Something, and you know, I just. I feel like I'd like to make more steps than just just hearing more reports. Yeah, I, I guess that I would like to propose possibly a kind of a parallel process where we continue to get this feedback, but ideally start to work with SpringsNet to figure out what that RFP would look like. I mean, I think it's clear that we all seem to identify that we need to figure out how we're going to market it. So maybe that's a piece of it. Obviously, the engineering study. Um, I think there were mixed reviews about whether we needed to do, you know, the, the consumer survey or not. Um, but I just wonder if we could, yeah. So. I, think, I think somebody needs to talk to businesses. As far as I know, businesses haven't even been consulted, and they are going to be a huge user. They're they're being that's being touted as the big user, and they haven't even been talked to. So I certainly think we need to talk to. Um, our major employers and our major, our biggest users. Um, I know I said this to you before. Um, in terms of Karen, in terms of uh, 
the role that NAVECA can play as a quasi-governmental, or maybe not even quasi-governmental um, body. And uh, I would like to understand that better, uh, what role they can play, uh, because they're, a, you know, they're not like a private. Yeah, they're right. a council of governments. Yeah, yeah. So. I know you said, well, they would be playing a significant role potentially if we went forward, was what I thought you said. Yes. But, um, but you know, if, there's, if they're, a res they're also a resource, so I'm just trying to understand what's the, you know. Right. I mean, the extent to which they can be a resource for us versus thinking we have to, like, I don't know, some of the work we might want to do, I mean, can they do it? Do we really want to do an RFP? I, I mean, there we would we would be hiring them. They would be they would be operating part of the the, the server. I mean, explain to me. So Brian, there, explain there, what they would be doing. Uh, the data center basically pipes in the internet to the broadband. So that's the piece. And having that in town means we don't have to you know build all this extra infrastructure to bring it in from Springfield or. In fact, they're connected to Springfield and Columbus and, and so on. So having that right here, that is basically the pipeline for, you know, the juice. Do you want the the RFP for the feasibility study, do you want that to include the various models that you can build this under? Because you've got straight municipal, you've got uh, public-private partnerships, you've got private entities that offer at a lower rate, um, similar to what we're doing with the, the solar array. Do you want the feasibility to study to include which one? How those look, each of those look for the village? Because you would have to detail that in your RFP as to you know, what you want to see. Is that something Brimstead can help us figure out what the... Well, I mean, it, I, I think it all needs to go into the feasibility study to, to find out which way is the best for the village. I, mean, I think these guys have done quite a bit of research into it, and that that will certainly be helpful. But but SpringsNet has made has made a recommendation, and the recommendation is that we go with municipal municipally owned fiber. So I think if we want to examine other other options. structures and other options we would need we would to go with somebody as dependent. I mean sorry guys, I just <laughs> Yeah, gotcha. Well the, the paper the the white paper from Princeton mm -hmm. mentioned well, I guess I've written about about ten entities maybe that apparently have been successful. Right. And I would I would think getting some more information being able to actually talk to someone, getting some more information right. would help us look at what kind of feasibility study we want. I mean, if everyone says, oh, municipal loan is best, or whatever they say, then that's important. And one resource we do have that SpringsNet mentioned is uh, Deb Sosha from mm -hmm. Next Century Cities. Right. She can connect us mm -hmm. with those um, contact people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and she's great to work with. I, I like her a lot. Anything else? Okay, yeah, so I mean, so what, what are we talking about? That we would have kind of a, some bullet points about what would go, potentially go into the RFP that we could look at um, with some assistance from SpringsNet. And I mean, I, I do know, you know, a couple things that, um, you know, we haven't seen, you know, like there has been a lot of work on the polls, so there may be some of that work that's already done that we may be able to finish up in-house. Well, I mean, Johnny had a survey of the polls done, which is, I think, basically what um, SpringsNet used to base their information on, but that there was the confusion over the DPNL versus AT&T mm -hmm. versus, AT versus Village. And I think that Matt Cole was working on updating the, the you know, financial right. scenario based on that. Um, so, so, And that's why I almost imagine, sorry to interrupt, but kind of like a, you know, here are the things that could go into the RFP, and then maybe you know some comment from SpringsNet, um, and then some things that we could evaluate as well. You know, do we do we care about the consumer survey for the take rate or not? You know, and that, and that kind of thing. Um, so, okay. 
Okay, so what I have is um, bullet points for the RFP for the feasibility study plus for the research, which would include um, the information in the, the Princeton white paper and potentially also Deb Sosha. Um, although I hate to bother her, I'm going to turn around and call, call these people directly anyway. Um, but um, because they, if for the most part they've been very helpful, it's just difficult getting a hold of anybody in the, in the summertime. Uh, but um, I do have Deb's number if I need it, and then I have the Spring Snap folks who could also help me. I, I'm guessing that there's that there are tons of RFPs floating out Absolutely. there. I mean, and that's why don't you just get a few? Yeah, right. that, that's what I intend to do is get a few from from some of the successful communities to see what they included and, and maybe use the bullet points for that. Um, it just it makes it a lot simpler. Yeah, I think um, that would be good. And then um, maybe if the if the Springs that folks um, feel that they could survey the businesses, that um, might be helpful. Something. I've already written it down. Okay. Yeah, because that, like that, that would probably not be something that I would have the time to, to make sure we got that. But. And I do want to say I love the business plan idea because that you know Absolutely. includes a marketing plan, Ooh. and I think that kind of exercise once we you know get a little bit further would be yeah. really good. Yeah, I agree. Um, and yeah. Yeah, just real quick. Um, the uh, part of the uh, feasibility study would include an engineering study, which would really help us nail down really precise cost estimates. And uh, I've come to learn since uh, our meeting the other week that uh, the cost to do that isn't real expensive. It's about five dollars per premise. So if we're talking eighteen hundred. We're talking nine thousand dollars to do a, an explicit engineering study that would give us detailed uh, cost estimates. But, but it's not, that's not the construction drawing. That's not the actual right. okay. engineering. Uh, yeah. Thank God. I yeah. mean, I figured there had to be something besides a $200,000 right. engineering in fact, study. The so. fact that we've already done a poll survey and that we've enhanced it at SpringsNet with the map and all that stuff would allow that to happen even faster. Oh, that's great. That's So uh, that's a very affordable figure, I thought. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that would great. Be, yeah. I think an important part of the feasibility study. And, and again, SpringsNet in the capacity of a village manager advisory board we all stand ready to help, right? Okay, that's great to know. I mean that. And and also we would leave that uh, an accurate count of the premises. Uh, there was some debate about exactly where we were with mm -hmm. between 1,800 and 2,200, and I think Melissa was going to look into that a mm -hmm. little bit to see what that number was. That would be an important thing to come up with before we embarked on the uh, mm -hmm. engineering study, anyway. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Um, a couple of questions. Have we affirmed that SprintsNet is the uh, village managers? I have. I have not officially appointed them yet. Um, it, that's okay. since it would be a, a, ma a village managers advisory board. It's just a. That's up to you. Basically, we just say good idea. I mean, if count, yeah, if council intends to move forward with this, it, it, it would be a great help to you guys. The other thing about the number of users, elected users, the difference between 1,800 and 22, possibly some of that is businesses. Because I that's, know a, that's total. Yeah, because I know that uh, whatever 2010, whatever the census was, listed about 1,800 residential units. So and if you add all the little big and little businesses, oh, oh so if it's residential units, then that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That so yeah, that wouldn't be. 400 businesses makes that makes about some sense too. So, yeah, and all our numbers were based on 1800, so 2200 is going to look even better. Well, and especially if those are the larger users, right. although, exactly. yeah, okay, sounds good. So, we, it sounds like we've got direction for staff. Thanks, guys. Uh, Next is manager and assistant manager and clerk reports. Um, the water consum consumer confidence report um, went out with bills last night, if, or last month. If you did not get yours or you misplaced your copy and would like another one, you can find it online at www.ysa.com. Um, Melissa, do you have any in your office? I think we do have some down the there office. Are some, yes, there are some down. available in the utility office as well. 
Uh, we have received the impedes permit that the EPA is going to require to filter backwash discharge uh, channel at the water plant, so we're up and running with that. Um, we are finishing up the required lead and copper sampling throughout the village at the private residences. Um, we did have one that was slightly higher um, than uh, detectable levels, and we are going to retest that. In fact, we're going to do a double retest on it, just to be sure. Uh, at this point, we believe it was a false false high read, um, but we are going to retest to be sure. And that was at one residence that was not uh, village-wide. It was at one of the um, 15 that, or uh, 17 that we had gotten back at the time. The police department will be hosting countywide training with both Greene County Courts and the prosecutors, instructing um, to update all of the officers on the domestic violence statutes, and I love the key out of that word, um, as, well as, as well as temporary protection order, orders and other topics. The Odd Fellows Parade, as Brian mentioned earlier, is on Monday, July 4th at 3 p.m., starting uh, Xenu Avenue from Herman to Quarry Street, and then the fireworks begin at Dark at Gaunt Park. Patty, do we have any work from ODOT on Xenu Avenue? We do not. Are we asking? <coughs> uh, Jason asked them, and they said, we don't know. Great. Okay. Um, Melissa? Um, any, any, wait, any questions for Patty? Okay, Melissa? Nothing other than the 2015 audit is complete and is in the packet, so that's a done deal and it's filed with the auditor and available for public viewing. And I would like to uh, commend Melissa once again on a clean audit. That is an incredible achievement. She does a great job. Good job. Yes, thanks a lot, Melissa. Uh, nothing earth shattering except this afternoon. I did get a call from Lisa Mock and the um, Board of County Commissioners did approve the annexation request, so I'll be going in tomorrow to pick up paperwork from her and sign off a few things, and then we're into the next phase. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to Board and Commission reports, we'll start with Jerry. Um, <coughs> yeah. Let's see what I Planning Planning. We've been busy. Uh, we are currently looking at, uh, I think we initially approved uh, the 88 Dayton Street. That we yeah, Dayton Mailing Service. Dayton Day Day Mailing Service, the brewery with uh, uh, food trucks. And there was another, there were two food trucks, weren't there? Or was it just um, one? This one. Just the, just the just yeah. One. And I can't remember the third one. Well, you were going to have a third condition it's used, but right, I think it got and pulled. And that one got pulled. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll move, moving forward. Uh, I'm in the finance committee. Finance committee, well, you, you, you got to make finance. <coughs> uh, anyone have any issues with that? Any finance? But it appears that we're in this one. Brian? Um, okay, community resources, no updates. Um, the uh, Economic Sustainability Commission is uh, now doing a deep dive on uh, reviving the revolving loan fund. And we had a great report about some uh, potential financing that the village could secure once we figure out exactly what we're targeting with the revolving loan fund. So I think that's really exciting. Um, also, uh, more work is going to be done on the uh, uh, recommendations for a uh, village policy for incentives, uh, looking at what we've done in the past and, and then uh, making it so that we've got a more uh, objective approach to that. Um, and the group is going to send us some goals next month. Uh, community access pan panel, still on hiatus, uh, arts and culture commission, uh, I think two interesting things here. One is that the group has worked a lot on um, sort of how to build out the commission section of the website, and I think that might be a good model for other commissions to see what they can do. Um, so in fact, we're gonna be meeting myself and one of our members, Brittany Baum, uh, with Judy and Ruth Ann tomorrow, just to kind of look at how that might uh, pan out. And uh, some interesting ideas, uh, one of them being a uh, area 
where people can take selfies in front of Tom's and promote the village and uh, show that we're the best place to be and with the coolest people. Uh, something I guess other communities have done. So I like that the group continues to look at sort of uh, ways to promote uh, the village and economic development within the realm of public art. So they're putting up one of those cans in front of Tom's? Well, the idea is more of a backdrop. Um, Besides the brick wall. Right, right. And so, you know, the caption says something like, you know, the, the coolest people. The most what, interesting person in Yellow The most interesting the person in Yellow Springs, oh, yeah. Um, but just looking so for. You do a exactly. And then, you know, hashtag it and put it out there. And, and the group did a lot of research, though, on just other communities and how they use this in an intentional way to promote the, the community. Okay. Um, Judith? Uh, I feel like I'm very bad because I forgot my notebook again. Uh, but just to say the Library Commission, um, there were just several questions and uh, Patty, I'll get you that list, just uh, little repair things that uh, they just want to, you know, know where things stand, just little hot stuff. Sure, yes. Yeah, so I will get you that. I'm sorry I meant to bring that. And then the Energy Board, um, well, they're excited that we're going to be putting the electric sta uh, car stations mm -hmm. in. And what's the name of that car? Again, I forgot my Tesla. Tesla. The Tesla. So they 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 were suggesting um, that. So this was something that uh, eventually will probably come to uh, staff and council. Is if a Tesla, uh, if it could be in the exact same place, that also Teslas could uh, charge. So yeah, you could put both chargers in the same spot. Tesla so actually will give you free. Chargers. They give them free charges. So that was a suggestion, but they're basically energy board just kind of looking at the next steps of its, its activity. That was, one, that was one of the things that I did the next one. So, um, Justice System Task Force, just to say, Grant and I have interviewed a bunch of people and um, really good candidates. We're intending to, by the end of the month, uh, bring recommendations to council. And then we told everybody we, did, we made the decision after kind of thinking we need to get started right away to just wait till September because uh, people's holiday vacations and so on. Um, I think it's going to be a really diverse and good group and represent the different uh, concerns of the village. So it's going to be good. Okay, Mary Ann. Um, I don't have any updates for the mediation program or the school board. Um, I was not at the last environmental commission meeting. I do have some updates about the glass farm grant work, and I, maybe Patty has some other things. But so the glass farm grant work is uh, is continued work on removing invasives and and uh, putting in uh, native plants, um, working on the easement uh, that's come risen up to the top is something that needs to get done quickly. Um, we've identified potential members for the Beaver Management Task Force, and we just have to get them to send in their little letter of intent to Judy, which we're working on that. And uh, I'm going to be meeting with uh, a local contractor to start looking at uh, designing the parking area. So I don't know if Patty or Jerry, if you have any other no, I don't. No, I think you asked me to. I did. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. Thank you. Cycling. Um, Human Relations Commission. We had uh, Guy Jones from the uh, Miami Valley Council for Native Americans come and talk about uh, the concept of developing an Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, I think we will continue to talk about that. We were very moved by his presentation. Uh, issues about the recent couple in, well, primary incident with the police uh, was brought to HRC that we've already discussed at the last council meeting. Um, I have met with Melissa about the idea of utility roundup. Melissa and I talked. I'm in the process of calling a couple of communities about that. Um, you want to explain what that is? Oh, yeah, the concept of uh, letting uh, villagers round up their utility bills, one idea would be like the next dollar. And then that, that money could be 
given to a separate organization to administer for um, low-income residents. And there are various issues, um, but one community that's doing that is using a community foundation, and the fund, they're not, they're not using the money, though, to pay for utility bills. They're giving money for, like, if they're medical expenses or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to the other community. So my, my goal is to come to council once I have a little more information and uh, we have the sort of pros and cons of that. Uh, and then just trying to uh, strengthen how the finances work for HRC. I have a Green County Regional Planning Commission meeting tomorrow. I honestly, I don't think we did much. Our last meeting was very short. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, and this is something that Marianne had brought up, the whole issue of pedestrian safety, and they do have a, a great campaign going on right now focused on pedestrian safety. Um, and I've talked to them about whether they may have tools or um, materials or potentially even some um, financial support um, for us to do something so I can find out I'll find out more that about that at the next MERPC meeting and they also presented on the going places tools and they really do have a lot of opportunities to um, a lot of tools a lot of GIS options that they can work with us or work with communities Denise has met with them a couple of times so I think that you know she's fully aware of what uh, what services they can provide um, in terms of the chamber, um, we had a very successful street fair. Um, I want to express appreciation um, to the village and Miami Township Fire and Rescue and the schools for being great partners. I also want to uh, express appreciation for having great street fair coordinator in Alex Scott. She is amazing and um, continues to excel in the work she does. Um, we have some new businesses. Um, uh, Ohio Antique Trading Supply has moved into the space on Xenia Avenue that was vacated by Urban Handmade, who is now in a much, much larger location on Cory Street. And um, they will be able to expand their, their graphic design business. They've dramatically expanded their retail space, doing some online, and they're also um, adding a maker space. So what they have happening is really exciting. Then another new business is called Liebling. Um, it's uh, Christine's Beard, Christine Beard's business um, next to Import House on Dayton Street. What is it called? Liebling. I'm sure there's a German. My love. What is that? My love. My love. Well, thank you. Did you say a Mexican import? Huh? <laughs> What's the business? Liebling. No, I know. But what does it do? Oh, they do. Um, she's doing. Um, what is she doing? Repurposing of furniture, repurposing of architectural kinds of items. Reuse. Yes, reuse, reuse. Yes. Um, Yellow Springs Brewery has purchased a new building as, and is expanding their um, distribution and canning operation um, down south of town. And um, July 12th, Dayton Mailing Service is having a ribbon cutting at 5.30, I believe. You'll be getting invitations. Where's the, the old bowling alley? The old bowling alley. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are they um, doing <laughs> Actually, I think that they may be doing something fun with it. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Instead of a bowling pit, it'll be a bowling alley. Yeah. Um, so July 5th. Um, Agenda and again, remember that's a Tuesday um, because July fourth is on a is on a Monday. So um, ordinance will have the second reading of the agreement with Morris Bean for a sewer tap to the village. Um, we tabled. I don't know that it sounded like we were necessarily in any hurry to bring back that other ordinance, um, or we or are we bringing it back to this meeting. We'll, we'll try to get a draft before that. Okay. Well, just if, yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. Um, that's all we have on the agenda, at least at this point. Um, Patty or Judy, Melissa, are you aware of anything else? Tax budget. 
Oh, oh, tax budget. Oh, that's on this. Okay, tax budget. Okay. And then, so we've added that we're going to start looking at the RFP. For right. Okay. Yeah. Municipal broadband. Yeah. might be bringing uh, a recommendation for membership of the justice system task force. Okay. Right. And are the HRC as well? Oh, and HRC uh, and and hopefully the Beaver Management Task Force. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're just saying that another member you're, for, HRC. for HRC? Yeah. Just one member, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And well, possibly, possibly another alternate. alternate. Okay, um, that's all July 5th. Um, July 18th, right at this point, we've got funding of commissions, discussion regarding distribution of proceeds from the sale of village land and village funding of special events. Um, anything else? So, um, you may at that point have something from the planning commission. Okay. Yeah. Um, were we supposed to also have this special event? Special events. Oh, so related to village funding of special events, <coughs> how are we going to discuss that topic? What's the because I know we had talked about kind of thinking about the overall policy. That's correct. And um, what staff intends to do is just present some data and some suggestions to council and. So what kind of and special events that you're thinking about are it, things like? It's any special event that takes village staff time is what, is what we've been focusing on so as a staff. Examples are? Um, well, street, street fair, fair obviously. Um, it, the 5K run, the Simply Women 5K, the zombie walk, um, village right. fair. And does, it, clubs. does it make sense to have a policy discussion, though, first before? Just to talk about what, and, and that was, that's something that I presented at the retreat. I presented um, basically a report um, about how we might want to look at the entire budget and, and how we fund not only events. I mean, I, I, to me, it's hard to separate out events. We've got other things we give nonprofits money for. I mean, we, we gave Tecumseh Land Trust money. We gave um, Arts, Council. Arts Council money. Home we we, home have, home we have partnerships with Home Inc. To me, it's very hard to, to look at these things in silos. And to me, they all relate because they all relate to spending. They all relate to policy on how we spend our money. Why don't you include your piece from the retreat in the discussion document? Any updates you want to make? Okay. As well as what staff develops. But again, it's still it's still putting it in silos. I mean, it's still it's it's still starting out with the decision that staff that, that staff is making that we do something before we've ever had the policy discussion about whether we. How do you see? Well, I mean, I feel a little uncomfortable about it. I mean, I don't want it, you know, I don't want it, but it, it just, it does feel to me as if, you know, we should articulate what our policy is and why we think we should have a partnership um, to, to build affordable housing with Home Inc. You know, I mean, I think we, we have articulated that, but I think at some level, um, what does what do the events do for economic development? Is that a value that we should be promoting? I mean, we're we're not asking about we're, nobody's talking about what events do to promote economic development well, and I to support our businesses. Be right, and it, I actually mentioned that the, at the last discussion was that a lot of people see these events as economic development events. So. It's it's still siloing things. But I mean, everything got, is in a silo. You have to sort of decide what you're going to put them But do you want to just uh, list oh, all yeah. those things? Or? Um, I don't know. Well, what if we talked on July 5th about 
I, I mean, maybe just some ideas about how this discussion should be structured. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it is a matter of we just want it all, but maybe there are a couple layers. I mean, I guess I have been personally wanting to, you know, dig into, you know, just why we support nonprofits and, and the economic development piece and all that. Um, I don't know. And I think it was something that 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 Brian in particular, because I think he was probably doing more more presentation on the levy. I think it was something that he in particular felt sensitive about during the levy discussion because he was getting questions. So why are we spending money? Why should we pass this levy when council is spending their money in this way? And if we don't have an articulated policy about why we spend money in a particular way, and and you know to to but connect, most of our money doesn't go to these kind of projects that go to police streets. Except not, you don't mean talking about that part of the budget. Maybe I you know maybe I, you know streets is economic development. You know street repaving a street can be considered economic development. Adding adding water and sewer lines is economic development. I mean, I, I know what I've laid out here is is it certainly makes it a bigger discussion than you know it makes, it, but it also I thought we had talked about that. It also fits into how we how we um, how we do the budget. We've been talking about commissions. Are we going to fund commissions? Are we going to fund anybody beyond HRC? And and. The budget's coming up. I mean, we're doing the tax budget. We're going to be starting to do our first blush on the budget in what, September? Mm -hmm. September, we've been talking, we talked last year, oh, we're gonna come back and we're gonna have a, a policy on how, on funding commissions. We haven't even, we haven't talked about it. So we're just gonna give, you know, we're, but we're not gonna, you don't, you're not suggesting we have to talk about police department. No, I mean, no, probably not <laughs> no. police department. Probably okay. not police and street. I mean, it's more about. Um, I mean, maybe I would do. It would be called soft dollars. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to. I don't know. Know if I know how, how to. But I'd be willing to just sit down with you and have a conversation, and then come back with sort of something in writing, framing what you're. That we could. I thought I'd already done that, but apparently mm -hmm. not. I thought I'd already done that, well, but I guess maybe I had not do it well enough. Then maybe you just, just resubmit it. Yeah, that's what I think. You, thought, you think you had done something at the retreat? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote the thing out for the retreat as to how, how I think we should be looking at our investments can, differently. Can that be resent out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, send that out. So should we change that to a pol policy discussion regarding village funding of various events and just broadly look at that before you drill down on it? It's almost like non-governmental spending. Yeah. Any, yeah mm -hmm. But it's not because yeah, yeah, uh, our commissions are governmental. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it wraps in. Non-essential services. Um, mm -hmm. And it what you know ties heavily to nonprofits for sure. Well, let's read. Uh, I would suggest we wait for Karen's already thought about it. And, we, and are we, we, we when she's written. are we going to have the discussion regarding distribution of proceeds from the sale of village land? Is that going to be? Are we going to be ready for something more on that? Um, I know that Johnny is working on the. Um, design for the, the potential crew quarters and I can ask him if he has that uh, ready. I think it should be almost done. Um, but Jerry, have you gotten yeah, any please. response from, um, is it Ms. Jackson that you were contacting? Well, what, what we've been trying to determine as to how we for what purpose? Yeah. some of these properties that we have and what is there a Did they come with specific units uh -huh. to this matter? Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and we, we didn't find a lot as you know, yeah. in, in the record, the village record. So, hmm. just trying yeah. to now contact some of the old men to see if some of them can. Yeah, I didn't put any. Yeah, we have, we have the list. We have yeah. the list of our properties that have 
um, the address and the acreage with them um, and that type of thing. It's just the, the background information and the additional information that council had requested on the background. I mean, for instance, we know Beatty Hughes was, um, was bought as a green space with the HUD money, but, and everyone is under the impression that there's a restriction on it, but there's not. That was actually list, lifted by a memo shortly after that property was purchased. Um, it was lifted by a memo at HUD. So we actually don't have a restriction on the Bay Hughes property, but at least we know why it was originally bought. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was one of the few that we were able to come up with an actual reason. So but the two monies we're talking about is the land we were selling to the Glen well, no, Allen, and then the land that was sent to Homey, right? What is it? Well, it's any other pieces of property yeah. that we have that we might want. Yeah, the discussion, the discussion on the, the Tecumseh, what we're selling from Sutton Farm to, right. uh, to the Glen, the discussion on that brought about a, we'd like to look at all of the, have kind of an idea of what we would do with the money if we sold other village properties. I think there but was, I think we have those two specific properties that we right. actually need to make a decision right. yeah, on exactly. at some point. So we're going to have a, an initial discussion, but then in the end, that's... Yeah, I mean, I think that there was some, last year, last year possibly may have been, you know, that there was some discussion on council or the year before of the idea of actually selling some of the property, and, you know, um, intentionally selling it as a, a revenue source. So, you know, is there a reason for us to be holding on to some of the properties we have? That was, that was also what was going into that. So, I mean, so it sounds like we will have something ready for that. Um, I will I will get with Johnny tomorrow okay. and ask about if the we design do. for the group. Okay, so and if, if we don't, we don't. So we can just take it off the agenda. It sounds like we'll have we'll have plenty otherwise. So um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So, second. second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.